Dr. Ted Roberts. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for making some time to join us. Uh, good to be with you. Really appreciate you here on the CBC Curiosity Project. This is Ted Roberts, the founder of Pure Desire Ministries International, as well as for many years the senior pastor at East Hill Foursquare Church in Gresham. Your history is long and varied. Gentlemen, old guys, what you're saying? <laughs> You've been walking faithfully with the Lord for a good long while, and I've got so many questions about um, all about all of that, as well as your experience in working with people who are going through a period of crisis and how they've been restored mm -hmm. uh, to continued fruitfulness in ministry. But why don't we just get started with, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you first encountered Christ and what were some of the key formative things as you grew in your relationship with Jesus? And I met Christ in a bunker in Vietnam after having to kill people the earlier part of the day at close range, some NVA soldiers. And... Uh, <clears throat> My goals at that time were re re very clear. I was going to be the world's greatest spirit-filled fighter pilot when I came back to the United States. And I was minding my own business, and all of a sudden, one night, I was preparing for a flight, very difficult one, a formation night flying with four guys. There's going to be students on your wing, and they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. They're flying planes at you. It's crazy. Um, <clears throat> God spoke to me. I mean, an audible voice. He said, if you ever fly again, you'll do it without me. Now go teach my people that don't know they're my, my people. Oh, my. And I went, what was that? I flew one time in a church airplane, right seat. Young guy asked me to fly. We lost one engine, couldn't get the gear down. And I said, we'll just land the gear up. We do that in combat all the time. All the blood drained out of his face, so he started just getting really mad at me. I found a way to get the gear down. We landed. And then I told him what God said to me. He started throwing flight manuals at me, you know, screaming at me. So I started the process. After that, um, I... Went to cemetery for umpteen years, and I guess God sent me to seminary so I wouldn't hurt anybody because I was crazy when I started. Uh, I came back from Vietnam. My mom was an alcoholic. My stepfather swore I had seven stepfathers using me for a punching bag. Oh my! And so I was crazy. I came back from Vietnam. I scared my wife for about two months. I was just not out of my mind. And slowly I started coming to my right mind in seminary. Started seeing reality. And um, long story short, I ended up here at East Hill Church. Roy X Jr. walked into my office one day, threw a financial report on my desk and said, uh, read it. So I read it and I started weeping because it was so screwed up. The place was going downhill. Next, next week, he walked into my office and said, I'm sitting there for six months. I want you to close the doors on the place and come home. I said, okay, I'll do that. Walked in the front door over there, over the left. Most I walked in the front door, God said, I'll pay off the indebtedness. No, these are the people I want you to serve. Then one year, God paid off that four and a half million dollars in dentists we had behind the, behind the building. And we grew to 7,000 people. We only had a couple of hundred when we started, so it was pretty crazy. Wow. And then I looked at the congregation. 85% of them had come to Christ, and they didn't know Jesus from peanut butter. So they were in our congregation, and they were addicts. So I had to start helping people in a real way because the church wasn't addressing addiction at all. So I started Pure Desire Ministry. I looked in the Christian community, couldn't find anything on the subject at all, other than just don't do it, it's not good. So I went to Dr. Patrick Carnes, who's a world-renowned expert on sexual addiction. He kind of mentored me and became a good friend. He was abused by five Catholic priests, so he didn't have a high view of the church. So I became his pastor, quote unquote. We started a relationship, and he gave birth to Pure Desire Ministry here. We had 85% uh, of guys who were in pure desire groups had never gone to church anywhere else. They heard there was healing in the church. A novel concept came, got saved. So it became a major evangelism tool. So I realized every church in the United States is going to want this. They're going to be interested in it. So I went on the road to try to get churches involved. They would not listen at all. Hmm. It's been 30 years of pounding my head against the wall. So still trying to get churches to wake up. Hmm. Um, from a fighter pilot in Vietnam getting saved in a foxhole to coming home, pastoring a church through an explosive series of growth, now to um, helping shepherd this sexual addiction recovery ministry that meets a significant and a largely unmet need both in the church and outside as well. Right. What have you learned about God's faithfulness through all that time? Well, so in my worst efforts to screw it up, God's faithful. I've tried every way to mess it up, and God keeps redeeming it. Uh, really, the issue that we want to get at, because we're talking to leaders, is what sets leaders up for failure? 
because I've been pastoring pastors now for 30 years who are sexual addicts. And they always walk into my office and they always say, I came from a good Christian home. I go, right, why are you seeing me? They don't realize the dysfunction that was involved in their family of origin. And the limbic system, your brain, which the Bible calls your heart, is fully programmed by the time you're about six years of age. So you leave your family of origin with the window in the world that they give you. And that sets you up for real problems because as you, been, you get married and your wife has a different kind of experience and it's called conflict. Yeah. Um, so what sets guys up is they medicate their pain, either through power, money, or sex. And they medicate their pain because they don't want to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with it and they never face it. So first thing you've got to realize if you got issues in your life, you'll see it when you get married, and it'll come up big time, right? Yeah. You think you're perfect until you get married, and you find out you're not even close to perfect. Not even close. Not even close. So it's very important that um, you address the woundedness in your life. Now, you can't see it yourself. That's a problem. When you get married, you start seeing it. Or in ministry, you'll start seeing it when you find yourself working so hard to be okay. In other words, I had to keep you still growing because if it ever fell apart, it was... It's reflected on me. Oh, of course. Yeah. And that's 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 a crazy part of ministry. It's it's seducing. It'll just suck you right in and keep going and going and going. So the bottom falls out on you. And all the pastors that come in, I give them a, a adult in, attachment inventory. I take them through their family history. And I'll say, okay, that's dysfunctional. That's abuse. That's abuse. No, it's not abuse. That's abuse. And they, they don't understand the abuse is not so much you got to hit. Frequently in a Christian home, it's, dad never said anything to you. Yeah. 80% of the guys I work with have a deep father wound. And we did clinical surveys of churches now, and we found out that average evangelical church, 65 to 72% of guys sitting in the pew on Sunday morning are addicts. They don't realize they are, but they're sexual addicts. 50 to 58% of the pastors are addicts as well. And 25 to 30% of the women are addicts. So... We either deal with this issue or the church is going to be absolutely irrelevant in America in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. It's just really crucial. I want to touch on something you brought up at the beginning, which was this idea of the limbic system, mm -hmm. which exists sometimes as I think referred to as maybe the lizard brain or that kind of really responsive part that flares up in someone's life, right. especially under periods of great stress. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that men especially tended to medicate or numb um, through money, sex, and power. Mm -hmm. Help us uh, get a better understanding for what's happening physiologically in a sexually addicted environment. All right, sexual addiction is basically not about sex. It has anything to do with sex. It's about the way you medicate the pain in your life. Yeah. And that's important to understand. And let me say some fires off. There's only four options you have. Fight, flight, or freeze, or collapse. Hmm. Okay. So that's why you'll say something in your marriage that's absolutely stupid. You know, why did I do that? Because you got triggered and your limbic system powered up. Or you'll run and hide and you'll, normal guy, he'll, he'll start. What happens is the wife, she starts a conversation. 80% of the time, the wife will bring up the problem. And the guy will go, oh, I don't want to listen to that. So it sounds critical to him. So he withdraws, mm -hmm. stone walls, and she doesn't get any response. She starts coming back. What happens? She starts having contempt in her voice. Yeah. When there's contempt in the voice, 80% of the time, the marriage is over. It's the main, main thing that leads to the divorce. Yeah. And the guy stonewalls because once his heart rate goes above 100 beats per minute, he can't think of anything intelligent to say. Yeah. That sets the whole sequence up. So understanding why you do what you do is really foundational for healing. If you're going to ever preach and lead people, you've got to get in touch with your woundedness in your soul because you can't preach perfection. It's ridiculous. Right. Trying harder doesn't work. Mm. So let's unpack that a little bit more. If you're going to teach and lead, you said you've got to get in touch with your own woundedness that's a really difficult, scary, vulnerable thing to do. And sometimes, like you mentioned earlier, the church can be seductive where we want to present in a certain way because that's what people expect us to be as leaders there. What are some observations that you've made around how leaders can exist in emotionally healthy, vulnerable, and honest, self-reflective stances as leaders? Well, first of all, you need to tell the congregation you're not going to play games. You're going to be real. Hmm. Remember when I first came to East Hill Church, it was so crazy. I told the congregation, when it comes between you and my family, you lose. I'm walking out the front door. And I said that point blank. And I got tested on it a couple of times. They started heading out the front door, and they said, well, we'll think about it. 
What's really foundational, it should be as a pastor, hard part is to have anyone that you're ministering to get in a vulnerable, get, you get really close in their life and they know you. You need to have four guys that know everything about your life, all your secrets. Yeah. Um, if you don't, you're going to be set up to play games. Yeah. And it will not work. Problem is, there's not people in church that you can do that with very easily. It's true. So you normally have to find outside the church to do that. But you've got to have four people know all your stuff. And your wife needs to know that you're accountable to those guys. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. When someone goes through that process, engages in, like for me, it started with like a Genesis process, and now I've got a group that meets on a regular basis where it all comes out. Right. And I found that to be not only incredibly healing for me, but that stabilizing influence, those guardrails right. in my life. All right. So let's say, so if those processes are in place, I want to touch this back towards the gospel. What, from a, what do you see as uniquely kind of suited? How does the gospel uniquely assist someone trapped in self-destructive habits? Yeah. Well, I'll talk about sexual addiction because that's the most difficult addiction of all to deal with. Yeah. Um, it's always all addiction is driven by shame, and shame is different than guilt. Guilt, you did something wrong. Shame, there's something inherently wrong with you. Yeah. And you pick that up from your family of origin, almost always. So the truth is only the gospel can help a guy get free. Uh, I'm a certified sexual addiction therapist. It's not unusual to have a guy being counseling an individual for five, ten years. I don't counsel him for a year. If he didn't get healed for a year, I didn't, I didn't communicate well with him. Okay. Only Jesus Christ can deal with shame. Mm. Most important thing about it, the healing thing, about the whole process of getting a guy set free, is they start seeing themselves the way Jesus sees them. That's foundational. Call them prophetic promises. Now that's kind of a Pentecostal approach, but you know there's a whole bunch of Baptist people yeah. that don't like that. Mm -hmm. So I call it personal promises. Sure. What did God say to you, and who did He say you are? Not what did He call you to do, but who did He say you are? It's really hard for people to see that. Once they get that nailed down and they start living their life out of that, freedom starts coming to them. In fact, I think the gospel is the only thing that can set people free. But clinical tools are not optional. If you don't understand trauma, if you do not understand addictive behavior, you cannot help a guy. Because what will boil down to be saying to him in different terms, try harder, sucker. It never works. Put a nose around your neck and pull harder, and you're just going to choke to death. Yeah. It doesn't work. I really appreciate that insistence that it's the gospel that is the transformative agent. Mm -hmm but we cannot ignore the no. physiological or psychological underpinnings mm -hmm. of the trauma, the shame, right. and the addictive powers. Um, and so integrating the gospel with clinical mm -hmm. techniques um, is really helpful. So just, um, I know it's, it's, it's impossible to do in a kind of the, in the theoretical, but you mentioned some of those clinical techniques. Can you unpack that a little bit more? What, what kinds of processes would you be involving someone caught in sexual addiction in if they were sitting across from you at a table like this? Well, what I do is, first of all, the husband and wife meet together with us. We start with a couple because sexual addiction at its core is a family systems problem. It's not just a guy's problem. That's where the church messes up. They have groups for guys, you're never going to get them healed because he, you only find him half the truth. He's only telling the guys the truth. Half the truth in the group, well, my wife's the problem. You know, Bulls, you know, you're the problem, buddy. Get the wife in there, you'll find out what's really going on. So you've got to work with as a family system. And then you've got to help the guy understand what is he medicating, what's the issue of the pain that he's medicating. Understand, almost always it's about his family of origin. And when, we're not blaming mom and dad, you know, because you got poor potty training, okay? What we want to do is reclaim what hell stole from you. Dad and mom did the best they could. That's what you want to do. If, if you think your parents weren't perfect, and it's, so, and it's not okay, then you can be a parent for a while and try it. It's impossible to be a perfect parent. They'll screw up at some point. But you've got to have a very healthy relationship with your parents and your kids to work it out and process it. Mm, that family systems so, issue. Family yeah. system issue. Work together with a husband and wife because you've got her dysfunctional family impacting his dysfunctional family because you carry your family around your head. Um, there was a Grimm cartoon uh, years ago. You know, I don't know if you remember Grimm. This dog... And he says, it's great to leave your home. And he's running like crazy. And you see the collar's back here. Next for him, he's got the doghouse. He's dragging it with him. He says, if you can't, if you can just leave your family at home. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. And so the family of origin issues are huge. Helping to understand the addictive process. 
and then finally help them to understand the trauma they experienced in life. Yeah. Because I had all the personal trauma I had growing up, being used for a punching bag. My mom was an alcoholic. Like, I had never gone to cook anything, but my, my daughter, she got married. Her husband went and started cooking. She thought she did something wrong. She says, well, that's just my trauma. So I just, I didn't want to cook because my mom was an alcoholic, so I had to cook to have anything to eat. She was passed out on the floor. I grew up doing that. Hmm. So that's it. You have a family trauma, a personal trauma, and then a Vietnam on top of that. So. Yeah, my goodness. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's not what I'm hearing you say, perhaps, is that it's a long process. That God can work, and we believe in the power of the Spirit to transform a person's life. But the woundedness that we all carry and that we experience occurs to us over a period of time. <coughs> and then, would you say it's also, it, it's, it gets healed over a period of time as well? <coughs> I like to put it this way. You're wounded in community. You need to be healed in community. Mm. It takes at least a year. Well, the clinical studies have proven it takes a two to five year process for a guy to get out of sexual addiction. Two to five years before he stops his behavior. No, he should stop his behavior in nine months. But two to five years for him to finally be able to be intimate with his wife. Because mm. at the core of sexual addiction is an intimacy and attachment disorder. A guy can be masturbating his brains over here, but he won't relate to his wife at all. He's sexual over here and he's anorexic with his wife. Quite common. Because mm. it's terrifying. It's terrifying for him to be intimate. Because intimacy is not being close and comfortable. Intimacy at the core is being uncomfortably close, letting someone else look down at your soul, warts and all. Yeah. It's tough. It is tough. It's tough. Yeah. Normal addicts terrified out of his mind to be intimate. It just yeah. scares us not out of them. Okay. So two to five years for a full process of restoration. Mm -hmm. right. that. That's really helpful framework. As a younger leader myself, I often look ahead and you see kind of the the aftermath of pastoral failure splattered right. around the news in various places, be it, you know, abuse of power, abuse of finance, uh, money, sex, and right. power, right? right? One of those three things typically, typically male. Um, and we were chatting earlier about the idea that finishing well is not a place that someone wanders into. No, it, it's not arrived at without intentionality. Right. What have you observed and learned through your years of experience in working with people about the about what it would kind of can you distill some of that into the idea of or advice for people who want to finish well now what can we do to help make sure that we've got the best possible opportunity okay number one your wife will tell you if you're going to finish well or not okay your relationship with your wife is absolutely foundational um if you don't have a good relationship with your wife you're not close with her you you can't pass her well you can't lead well and you're eventually going to fail Second of all, you have to have that group of four guys. You really know all your stuff, and you're accountable to them ongoing. Third, you've got to be honest about where your vulnerabilities are and staff yourself. If you begin to begin to grow, you've got to staff in light of your weaknesses. You've got to have someone who can cover you here and will be honest enough to speak in your life about it. Mm -hmm. You do that, you won't, you, won't, you won't be too vulnerable. You can walk pretty well. Yeah. But the main thing is your wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a statement, and a man who doesn't listen to, listen to his wife is an idiot. And I say that men's retreats, it gets real quiet every time I say that. man's a fool if he doesn't listen to his wife. Yeah. The problem is she speaks the truth to you and don't want to hear it. Yeah, because it comes through that limbic system, and we mm, receive it as time. criticism, right. and our defense mechanisms go Bing. up. Right up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I know what that feels like. So. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say about this idea of finishing well is you've got to you've got to be honest with your family of origin. You've got to yeah. recognize your weaknesses. You've got to make sure that your relationship with your wife or your spouse is that's primary. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to have that cohort, your own kind of personal right. board of directors who knows you and is band of brothers. Yes. What I call them. Yeah. yeah. Um, who can be around? Mm -hmm. um, who. I, I always say I've, I've got a group I meet with weekly and I said it's so helpful for me I cannot ruin my life any di any direction for longer than six days without right. having to yeah. check back in you know? in. You guys are calling accountable for and it. Um, and that has been um, that has been a real that has been a real victory I think in my life and yeah. helping maintain <clears throat> some sense of stability and and things like that. So one of the tools that I know that Pure Desire uses, and, and, and maybe this is a little bit too technical, but is the, the, the idea of the faster scale. Yes. 
can you walk us? I remember encountering the faster scale through Genesis process. Right. Can you, for those who are un, unaware or uninitiated, can you kind of help us uh, walk us through that process? Because I think it gives us a really useful paradigm for understanding how relapse occurs right. within the context of daily life. Well, they found out that relapse occurs two weeks before you actually relapse. In other words, you're setting yourself up to act out. You're not in touch with it. Faster scale is uh, acrostic, faster, uh, forgetting priorities, anxious, uh, forget what, speeding up, mm -hmm. uh, exhausted. Yeah, ticked off. And ticked off, and exhausted, and relapsed. I think okay? so, yeah. Mm -hmm. What you do is you, you have various categories in each of those acrostic areas, and then during the day you identify, well, this is where I'm at. And it starts telling it because when you're moving down the faster scale, you're going down limbic. You're becoming more and more limbic. Eventually you're going to act out. Pain's getting higher and higher, got to medicate it. So what the faster scale essentially does is help you be present with where you're really at emotionally. Yeah. Most guys are not in touch with their emotions because mm. we think it's, it's macho to not be in touch with our emotions, okay? So the faster scale is absolutely foundational to understand where you're at emotionally, to see when you're going down the faster scale, and your relapse is coming up. You don't stay in touch with where you're at. You'll step in. Most addicts live in ticked off and exhausted. They circle right there. Yeah. And that's how many steps away from relapse? <laughs> One. One. Bam. <laughs> One. So that's what happens. It's very yeah. simple. You mentioned the key thing about, especially for men, especially the difficulty of staying in tune with their emotions. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I were recently discussing the value of kind of that self-check-in. How am I feeling right. now in this yeah. moment? And, and, and I have to come up with a feeling word yeah. instead of a thinking word. And yeah. I, and I, pr I lead through my thinking words. And I'm yeah. like, so what, uh, maybe, maybe coach me in that. What kind of recommendations would you give to a young man wanting to kind of become more aware, just raising his self-awareness around his emotional health? You have to understand there's more options than man said or glad. We have an emotional wheel. Guy can look in there and pick out some options. It, once you can identify it, once you name it, you can tame it. Mm -hmm. It's very important you be able to identify what your emotions are. It's extremely important to understand those emotions frequently come from the woundedness of your past. We do things like brain spotting and other neurological approaches that help you deal with the trauma in your past. It's down in your soul. Yeah. So it's really important. You got to listen to your wife. She'll tell you what you feel. <laughs> you do it all the time. You're feeling this right now. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm not mad. I'm not yelling. Right. You're not. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. It is so necessary, I think, to keep those open lines of communication and be able to receive uh, constructive feedback, let's put it uh -huh. that way, in a non-critical way. Right. And uh, <clears throat> that idea, we come back, we've mentioned the limbic system many times here, but it's that, it's that sense of where you feel threatened. Right? Mm -hmm. And that response to threat, like you mentioned, comes right. through in fight, flight, freeze, or mm -hmm. collapse. Right. And being yeah. able to maintain a sense of kind of connectedness to your own self. That's right. And being able just to say, I am feeling mm -hmm. in that moment I have found has helped me kind of prevent falling into right. kind of a limbic trap of responding in those very well, reactionary you articulate ways. You're getting in touch with your body. Yeah. And your body will, will react way before your emotions are even aware of it. So let's think a little bit about this. Um, we asked the question about like finishing well. It's not easy to do. It requires having a cohort, a band of brothers around you and things like that. What are some warning signs that you would want to make sure is clear in every young leader's vision that says further down this pathway lies a crisis. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Is there any early warning systems we can begin to build into <laughs> our lives to help us kind of catch it before it comes full bloom? And one is marriage. <laughs> I keep coming back to that again and again. Um, how you're doing with your wife will determine where you're going to end up. And you have to stay current. And you've got to be really responsive to her. That's because kind of, it, you know I was pastoring seven thousand people. And my wife leaned over one day. She says, I think you're more respectful of people in the church than you are of me. Oh, man. Went, that's got to hurt. Oh, ding, ding, ding. You got to have, if you get a strong wife, that's a real good option. I got a really strong one. She's got a two by four right here. She hits me right in the forehead with it. Um, <clears throat> to finish well, you have to love your wife really well and stay close to your kids. But you can't build your marriage around your kids. It's got to be around the relationship with the husband and wife. Your kids will end up weird. It's really important that the family of origin be
be reflected in your healing experience with your family. In other words, we all came from imperfect families, and we don't want to pass on any garbage. We got to identify where we're wounded and pass on what's healthy. I finally figured out being a pastor is being a dad. That's really what a dad is. A good dad will be a great pastor. And if you do that well, you won't screw up. You've had the privilege of serving a congregation of many thousands of people right. um, while still trying to maintain faithful marriage and present fatherhood. It feels overwhelming. Can you reflect a little bit upon that season of your ministry career where you kind of were handling those tensions of a large and growing church while still trying to maintain kind of presentness and faithfulness in the home front? Right. What, did you, what did you learn through that? You better have a good devotional life because you're going to need it. It's really important to have times where you're just with the Lord because I got so seduced in grow church growth. You know, yeah. the bigger churches, the better I am. It's crazy. Hmm. It's you, what you just said there is really key. The bigger the church, the better I am. I am. Not bigger the church, the better, but bigger the church, the better I am. Yeah. Where we're conflating yeah. our self-worth and identity into how many people show up to yeah. come. Yeah. Show me a pastor who doesn't feel that, and I'd say he's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's unavoidable in the process. It's really important for you to understand the church is not yours, it's God's. And he's the one that will decide where it grows or not, no matter what you do. And your object is to be faithful, show up and love the people, care for the people. But they'll drive you nuts. It's, you know, you get the very special people in the front row who drive you crazy. And you get some people that just drive you nuts. And it's just part of the process. Hmm. You just got to love them. Criticism is... Um, is a, is a tax that is paid by pastors to mm -hmm. pastor. Yeah. We mentioned earlier how in the marital context, constructive feedback criticism comes across as an attack and yeah. we respond often that way. In the ministry context, what have you learned about responding well to criticism? How do you handle it? I don't do real well there. Sometimes I get really mad and start swinging. <laughs> the biggest mistakes ever made was overreacting to criticism. Mm. That was the biggest mistake I ever did. And you have to understand that people are expressing the, out of their woundedness usually, and they're discussing. And when they point out the place you're screwed up, you know you've done it, and it really triggers you big time. It's important to take a deep breath, stay close to Jesus, and learn how to love people that are really a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. You just got to do it. I decided I made a promise. Long, I made a promise a long time ago. I'm going to out love and outlast all my enemies. Out love and outlast mm -hmm. all of your enemies. Yeah, because when I came in, there were tons of enemies. People hated my guts when I walked in the door. So I remember that. I was living hell for about five years. <laughs> wow. But faithfulness to the call of God and to shepherding a group of people yeah. and just showing up every day. Yeah. And yeah. realizing you're called. God's the one. You're, trying to, you're not trying to please him. He already pleased. He just says you please him. But you're trying to show up as a faithful servant. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. It really is. I'm fascinated by this idea of the contrast. We often think about like, am I called to be faithful or am I called to be fruitful? And there's a lot of focus on the fruitfulness you mentioned earlier, like, right. you know, kind of the obsession with church growth and, and the realization of recognizing that God brings the increase mm -hmm. and that my responsibility is to show up every day right. to be faithful. Right. I'm interested, obviously, when a church grows in size, so does the team that goes around to serve it. And often the, a lot of the um, attention of a senior pastor goes to kind of nurturing and pastoring his staff. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, how do you, what lessons have you learned about maintaining healthy staff relationships? The staff will drive you nuts. It's just part of the process. So that's why it's so important to hire people that have real character and quality. Yeah. Um, I've been at this pastoring stuff long enough. I've seen so many guys come and go. So many go belly up. Uh, Willow Creek was my big idol for a long time. Oh, sure. And I saw them go belly up. Yeah. Know, yeah, that's a that's a test case or a case yeah. study. And, so, yeah. and I this afternoon I got to confront a major denominational leader about sexual addiction. So it's going to be fun. Mm. You mentioned that one of the things that you look for in hiring staff, in character, competency. Yeah, chemistry. Uh, yeah. Give us a sense. I always like to ask the question about, you know, let's let's assume I was, you know, applying to be uh, on a position on your team. What are What's some of the things that you're thinking about when you're interviewing a, a, a leader to join your team? What are the things that you're trying to really try to discover in that process? Well, I'm trying to 
I'm trying to hire according to my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. What's the weakness I want this guy to help me with? And can I trust him? And it's just, it's a gut read. You know, it's, you hire people that turn out great and then others are just driving nuts for years. Yeah. I had one staff member when I first came, put a back, a stop, a knife in my back for 12 years straight. Every time I turned around, I just thought, put a slot in there, I made a permit, just stick it in there. He was constantly stabbing me in the back. I had to put up for 12 years. And I went, God, how come? He says, I'm going to train you how to be patient. Mm. So, throw me nuts. Wow. Tell me a little bit about some of the joys that you've experienced through working in pastoral ministry. The joy was seeing this place explode because there was no way it could ever make it. Um, it's just amazing to see the growth. I had so many people. I'm convinced that if, if you really have a healing ministry in today's world, you can't build a church large enough, a real healing ministry. And I see so many four-square pastors saying, we're, we're just going to be smaller churches now. I don't buy that. I think if we really become effective in a healing ministry, emotional healing, and talk about honest stuff, you can't build a church large enough for it. It's just people be coming in the walls. Um, well, what did I take off on this? Oh, uh, the joy of ministry. Of oh, seeing joy people, ministry, yeah. yeah people seeing people forth. heal. I mean, that altar in there, I remember seeing one little girl was deaf, seeing God heal her. A uh, woman came in with stage four cancer by a doc, nurse by three doctors. She was healed on the spot. I remember uh, uh, one person got her sight in there. It's just amazing to see God heal people. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah. The thing I missed, though, is I didn't realize I was in the middle of a revival and I didn't enjoy it at the time. I was so busy going to the next thing, so driven. I wish yeah. I'd enjoyed it more. Take time to celebrate. Yeah. yeah. I just enjoy what God's doing. Yeah. I was so busy. I was so afraid it was going to stop and reflect on me. Hmm. Thinking now about your experience co-founding Pure Desire Ministry and working with churches and groups all around the world to help address the issue around sexual addiction and bringing freedom through Christ. And um, Tell me a little bit about kind of what, what's your aspiration? What's, what's the goal that you have or what's the vision that you would, that you would hope that this generation that, you know, that, that sees almost pornography as the wallpaper of their world? Mm -hmm. um, what's the vision that you have for sexual freedom for this generation? Well, I'm hoping that other young men will catch what, what really needs to be done. I can mentor them and see them train. Thousands of people come to health and homeless. I pray the church would get honest, get real. Just, it's so much baloney going on. Yeah. In the name of God, that's what ticks me off. Mm. You know? Yeah. What is, I'm, uh, I want to kind of draw our time towards a close as mm -hmm. we think about this idea of the some of the roadblocks that prevent the kind of healing that's so necessary and so needed. You mentioned that there's this... Um, of, of str a deep difficulty in honestly addressing reality as it stands, mm -hmm. either statistically or personally. Um, what might a leader do to lead authentically and facing reality in that way in the, in the broader group context? There's one pastor I listened to on the air, and I wonder why he was so effective. And I picked up last time he spoke. He went through counseling for about, clinical counseling for about three years. He realized he was screwed up and he sought help. I think a pastor has to address his own issues and see it clearly and get help and then speak from his brokenness, not bleeding before the people, but speaking from the brokenness of the healing experience. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, just Bible study. It just, people are, they're wasted. Just give them, give them God. Would you please help people get healed? You know, just. Gosh, it drives me nuts. I, um, I love that idea of um, my wife studying to be a therapist herself right. connects me more to that world. And, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I'm encouraged to see in this conversation around mental health, which is, is, is the destigmatization mm -hmm. of going to see a therapist or right. getting, getting, you know, getting help in that area it used to be that that must mean that you must be really messed up. Messed up, yeah. And and I'm of the mindset that everybody, you know, needs we're to be. We're all broken. We're all broken. And and to be able to, like you say, lead from not from the bleeding edge, yeah, but from out of the the healing, the the process of healing, the yeah. the the wounded healer approach, yeah, um, to say that I. I have been. I've experienced reality. Yes, and and I've experienced the grace of yeah. Christ in that. The only thing that changes the limbic system is not, not data, but new experiences. You're broken in community. You need to be healed yeah. in community. That's right. And then be a healing agent in that community. Yeah. So I'm praying the next generation. 
I can speak to a number of young guys that are really called to be good healers and see them take off and really do something. And this, this real, not the charismatic crazy healer, but a guy speaking real health to people in yeah. their daily lives. I love it. See it. Ted, thank you for your faithfulness and your call to mm-hmm. um, to multiple generations to pursue healing, to pursue <laughs> I'm honesty. I'm an old guy, yeah, I know. <laughs> As we close, is there any kind of final words of wisdom or any kind of parting thought that you want to leave with our audience? I think uh, the thing I would have loved to have when I was starting out was I'd love to have a great mentor that I could really learn from. I didn't have that. What I'd do is if you see someone is really a- equipped, uh, a guy that's really doing what you'd love to do, take him out to lunch and say, hey, can I pay for your lunch? I want to learn from you. If you can find some guy that can really mentor you and give you a head start, that'd be phenomenal if you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Dr. Roberts, thank you for yeah. taking some time to sit down. Thank you for leading well in an incredibly critical area of the health of the church. And I'm praying alongside you that we see the kind of healing and wholeness and redemption Mm -hmm. Um, that your work is about. Where can people find out more about your work and Pure Desire Ministries? PureDesire.org. That's my, uh, well, it's just Pure Desire on the website. Just go on Pure Desire and you'll find all about it there. All right. Dr. Roberts, thank you so much. Appreciate your time.